fascism is a term I've heard thrown around since I was a kid, but most of the time, idiomatically. Fascist is what you called your type A passive-aggressive roommate. Stop being such a fascist, Deborah. Through osmosis, I knew its literal meaning was among a cluster of related words. Authoritarianism, totalitarianism, white supremacy, nationalism, dictatorship. But for much of my life, if you pressed me to define any of these words, I could have only said, you know, Nazis. Hitler. The Gestapo. You know, Nazis? This colloquializing of fascism and its association with the cultural shorthand for pure evil makes it very hard to discuss as an ideology, because even using the word fascism sounds both hyperbolic and like a punch below the belt. To call a person, group, or idea fascist is to exaggerate for the purpose of dragging them. This counterintuitively prevents us from criticizing fascist groups, even though most everyone agrees fascism is terrible, because saying it? You sound ridiculous. You're talking about Indiana Jones villains. So I'm going to be using the word fascism kind of a lot in this video, hoping that we can semantically satiate it just enough that its connotative meanings, irreverent sarcasm and the envisioning of stormtroopers, are dulled to the point that we can talk about fascism as a system of beliefs and as a mode of political organizing and about who practices it today. Our work necessitates a conversation about fascism, specifically white fascism. Fascism, fascism, fascism. Central to fascism is the belief that some people are more deserving of power than others, and that society's appropriate structure is a hierarchy where increasingly smaller groups of betters rule over the lessers. This is not unique to fascism, this is the organizing principle of many social systems. The differences between systems is whom each hierarchy says should be at the top. In a feudal monarchy, the top is the king and his family, and they get there by royal bloodline. In a capitalist free market, ahem, people earn their place at the top by success in business. In fascism, the ones at the top should be us, whomever us happens to be, and they should get there by any means available. The most succinct definition of fascism comes from Roger Griffin, palingenetic ultranationalism. A wonderful term because it fits a great many ideas into only two roots and a bunch of affixes, and a terrible one because both words need definitions of their own. So, okay, palingenesis is the idea of rebirth, with some frankly biblical overtones. The word palingenesis is used to refer to reincarnation, or the remaking of the world after Judgment Day. In terms of fascism, it is the notion that we, as a unified people, are ancient, that our former glory has waned, and that we are due to rise again. And the implication that this rebirth will come by purging the world in fire with boiling seas and a blood-red sky are not entirely accidental. It is the granting of us with mythological importance. Nationalism is, in the broadest sense, thinking of oneself through the lens of national identity. A single person holds a lot of identities. White, male, gamer, New Englander, cyclist, sports racer, and so on and so forth. Nationalism is the lens through which thinking of oneself as, for instance, American is distinct from being Canadian, Liberian, Chilean, and that putting stock in this distinction is desirable. This can play out a lot of different ways. Nationalism can be a colonized people forming an identity distinct from the ruling class and arguing that this people should have its own state, as in the American or Haitian revolutions. Black nationalism has argued, at times, that black Americans, while coexisting with other Americans, should maintain a distinct identity rather than be assimilated into white culture. And where black nationalism has also sometimes argued for the repatriation of black Americans to African nations, white nationalism typically argues that whites should have a nation of their own not by returning to Europe, but by removing non-whites from the U.S., something Native Americans have opinions about. This would be an example of ultranationalism, the emphasizing of national identity as among the most, if not the most, important. Now, these are not unique traits, and I want to stress that it is not the presence, but the confluence of them, that gives fascism its character. So, 
Palingenetic ultranationalism, the belief that the nation is of the utmost importance, that the people running the nation should be a narrowly defined us, and that we should rule because it's more or less our destiny. The religiosity of this framing is intentional. Most hierarchical systems will make some case for why society should be structured a certain way. The king has been groomed for his role since birth. Steve Jobs did real good at the business factory. Fascism suspends the need for explanation. We belong at the top because we just do. Destiny. When pressed, fascists will offer pseudo-rational justifications for why they should be in charge, which fall apart under the barest scrutiny. But debunking these claims is largely ineffective because, while they follow the cadences of a reasoned argument, they're operating on the level of emotion, faith, and a sense of belonging. There's a reason fascist regimes rely heavily on propaganda. Propaganda traffics not in arguments, but in symbols. For the Nazis, it was the German soldier. For the Soviets, it was the worker. Propaganda relies on inspiring imagery that evokes cherished aspects of the culture, like the family or the countryside. The babe in his cradle is closing his eyes, the blossom embraces the bee and ties those images to fascist ideals. But soon, says a whisper, arise, arise, tomorrow belongs to me. All of this is meant to make one swell with pride in such a way that it's very hard to think about what is actually being said. Racist caricatures of black and Jewish people, or whomever is not us in any given system, serve the same purpose by evoking hatred, or fear of what might happen to us if they were in control. Jason Stanley calls this effective override, the moment where emotion shuts down critical thinking. If you've ever had a conversation with a conservative about, like, healthcare or something, and after a few exchanges they're chest beating about how this is the nation of freedom and choice, the greatest nation that ever was, and I'm not going to let you take from me my God-given... You've seen this in action. Fascism depends on this passionate fervor because it can't convincingly pretend to be rational. The reason why one particular us should be at the top of the hierarchy, or why there should even be a hierarchy in the first place, is arbitrary. It's that way because a particular us wants it that way. We usually associate fascism with the image of state violence, be it the punishing of the other, the policing of citizens, or the conquering of other nations. And while this is almost always the case, Fascism is not, as a rule, militant. In practice, fascists are not authoritarians or pacifists. For that matter, they're not capitalists or anti-capitalists. They're not statists or anarchists. They're not monarchists, oligarchists, or plutocrats. They are whatever puts us in power-ists. For instance, capitalism is a hierarchical system, and so fascists will often try to influence policy such that the capitalist hierarchy starts to resemble the desired fascist one, but only until the point that it stops suiting their needs. The us of fascism is always defined by essential qualities like race or heritage, qualities that don't change. A poor person can become less poor, but a black person can't become less black. So no matter how biased and stratified capitalism becomes, so long as it is still technically possible for someone from the lower classes to rise above their station, there will come a time when fascists must leave capitalism behind in favor of a system fully without social mobility. Similarly, if fascists have the ability to take governmental control through nonviolent means, they will often do so. Remember, Mussolini took power in a coup. Hitler was elected. If democracy and nonviolence can be put to fascist ends, they will be. But instituting a system that benefits the few while the many suffer, and where, by design, no one suffering is allowed to improve their situation, might as well be writing ad copy for guillotines. And that's how you get the SS. So, yes, fascist power trends towards authoritarianism because, on a long enough timeline, it will be the only way fascism can maintain itself. 
But also, fascists and authoritarians think power, brutality, and subjugation are sexy in more or less identical ways. So while not all authoritarians are fascists, most fascists are authoritarians. And state violence is often a way of getting people invested in a hierarchy that doesn't directly benefit them. You may not be at the top, but if you're somewhere around the middle, we can employ you as military or police to keep the lower classes in line. Many people will relinquish their rights to fascists in exchange for being the arm of the law. And the more powerful the state becomes, the more vicarious power they get to wield. So long as they're not at the bottom, they have some investment in the system continuing as is because it authorizes them to fuck people up. The other way fascism justifies itself to the masses is to insist that the only alternative is death. We are a great and noble people with an illustrious history, and if we achieve our fated rebirth, we will form the most glorious nation in all of history and take our rightful place as world leader. And if we fail, we will be eradicated. There's no in-between. They are coming for us. They are everywhere. We can beat them. But this is the only way. Race war is the usual go-to, claiming black people are savages and raising our cities to the ground is their nature or that they want revenge for slavery, which, I mean, sometimes they go with a Jewish conspiracy as revenge for the Holocaust, or both at the same time. Right now, Islamophobia is in fashion. Each depends on downplaying slavery or the Holocaust or the Crusades as the horrific acts that they were, insisting that the crimes have been greatly exaggerated by history, because these are all pretty damning counter-arguments to us being the greatest people who have ever lived. Race is like gender and money. It's real, but only because we make it real. But fascism necessitates the belief that whatever makes us us is not only extremely real in the biological and or spiritual sense, but that people can be ranked by it. And when stacking the hierarchy, white fascists put themselves at the top. So, what is whiteness? Well, the short answer is that whiteness is whatever it needs to be. Whiteness was created to differentiate one people from the people they were oppressing. Whiteness is a means to an end. And the people most fixated with the definition of whiteness are racists. But there is no anti-racist definition. Racists invented whiteness, and all white people are folded into it. And the way white people conceive of whiteness is fundamentally different from how they conceive of other races. A common example of this phenomenon is Barack Obama. Obama had one black parent and one white parent. But while he can call himself the first black president, he could never call himself a white president. Or, well, he could call himself whatever he wanted, but white people wouldn't agree, and no one would treat him like a white president. White people are only white if they're pure breeds, or if non-whiteness is far enough back in their family tree that one can pretend it isn't there. These rules of purity don't apply to other races. When black and white people have children, those children are allowed to be black, or any number of often racist terms for mixed-race children. But whatever they are, they can't be white. This frames interracial families as an increase of one race and a decrease in whites. So by this logic, where other races spread, whiteness has to be maintained. White people don't consider whiteness a race. It is the absence of race, the undiluted form of which all other races are deviations. And if it goes, it can't be brought back. This is, of course, nonsense. It's a bunch of made-up rules to justify white supremacy. There's only so long fascists can insist if we don't strike first they're going to kill us all before people start to notice that the race war they've been promising for a century doesn't seem to be happening. So then the terms have to be updated. Now the existential threat is a generational project. Now black people even existing near white people is the race war. They're literally going to fuck us out of existence. And because whiteness is made up, it can be endlessly redefined. A tension inherent to fascism is that rather a lot of people are required to bring it into existence, but by design only a small number will run it once it exists. So commonly the definition of us is broadened while building coalitions and gets progressively narrower the more fascist society becomes. 
white fascists in the US and Europe go back and forth on whether or not Jewish people get to be white. For a while it was kind of a soft yes, and now it's tipping the other way as they gain influence. Ethnic groups formerly considered non-white, like Italians and the Irish, became white when white culture feared marginalized immigrants might ally with slaves in revolt. Bigotry is intersectional. There aren't a lot of single-issue bigots, people who hate Mexicans but fight for everyone else's rights. People generally don't apply this hierarchical thinking to just one aspect of their lives. So, commonly, racism is comorbid with anti-Semitism, is comorbid with misogyny, is comorbid with transphobia, is comorbid with homophobia, is comorbid with religious intolerance. I mean, just listen to a Klansman talk about Catholics sometime. Or, better yet, don't. Any marginalized group may be inducted into the tribe to consolidate against a common enemy. But should that enemy be defeated, the inductees become the new enemy. We can see the history of social progress in the U.S. as successively disenfranchised groups demanding and sometimes gaining their rights one by one, with reactionaries trying to beat back the tide. Transphobia is recently rampant in fascist circles, and conservative politics, because with the legalization of same-sex marriage, the battle against homosexuality is thought to be lost, or at least at a ceasefire. This gives some cause to welcome gay transphobes into the ranks, but should they seize enough power to strip what few protections trans people have gained recently, and the alliance is no longer useful, their gaze refocuses, and it's last hired first fired for the homosexuals, and then the African Americans, and then the women, and on and on stripping rights from social groups in the order opposite to which they were gained, like the plot of Final Destination 2. You might be thinking the end goal here is a nice homogenous group of white men to sit at the top of the pyramid. And white fascists would be thinking the same thing. But in reality, there is no end game. It's not like if the fascists get their ethnostate, they're just gonna call it a day. It's the flaw in obsessing over racial purity. Whiteness is defined by what it's not. If it isn't contrasted with something else, it ceases to be an identity. So if the whites kick all the non-whites out of their country, suddenly the Irish and Italians aren't white anymore. And then maybe the albinos, or the brunettes, or the Virginians. It doesn't matter. The rules are made up. One way or another, the pyramid grows thinner. The authoritarian mindset is one that just likes stripping rights from people. Leave authoritarians no one to strip rights from, and they start stripping them from each other. And yes, that's what the research says. The other outlet for this restless energy is war, invasion, colonization. Deport all the Mexicans, and then follow them into Mexico. Go seeking an other to define yourself against. Now you've maybe noticed that these three drives, the seeking out of conflict, the need to subjugate more and more people, and the shrinking of one's base of power, is not a recipe for success. Most hierarchical systems seek equilibrium, finding the point where the masses are just happy enough that they don't disembowel you. But the trajectory of fascism is to make enemies, cast out allies, narrow the gene pool, and stuff your ill-gotten wealth into the military until you're fully stocked with the kinds of weapons that ensure mutual destruction. I'm not the first to say, white fascism is a suicide cult. The history of fascism is one of atrocity, followed by failure, followed by disgrace. So modern fascists operate in a cycle of constant reinvention as they try to distance themselves from the movements that came before. The ideology doesn't change, but the rhetoric does. Primarily by stealing rhetoric from the left because it's flatly more popular. White nationalists calling themselves identitarians is an appropriation of progressive identity politics. The rhetoric of white power is an intentional bastardization of black power movements. Even the Nazis, while instituting a dictatorship, knew to call themselves socialists, and despite German anti-fascism being formed predominantly by socialists, and the first death camp being originally built to throw communists in, some people still believe this? This appropriation of rhetoric is how each generation of fascists rebrands itself. We're not like those fascists who got hanged for what they did. We're young, hip, and successful. Come back, baby. It'll be different this time. 
So with all this explanation of what fascists believe and how they operate, I hope it's clear that there is no workable definition of fascism that does not include the alt-right. They are, to the letter, a white fascist movement. That's neither a diss nor an exaggeration, it's a simple statement of fact. So then, to ask the trickier question, is the current administration fascist? And, well, that depends on where you draw the line between fascist and opportunist. Consider the evidence. The administration has staffed a number of fascist figureheads. It's repeated a number of fascist slogans. It employs a nationalist thinking in which the nation should always get more out of any deal than the other participants. It holds the hierarchical belief that the president need not follow the same laws as the citizens. It relies on fear and demonization of a racial other and portrays their mere presence in society as an invasion. It permits and makes justifications for violence against dissenters. It threatens to strip rights from opponents and members of the press. It relies on nostalgia for a mythologized past to sell a narrative of cultural rebirth, and its followers are intersectionally bigoted against women, the poor, Muslims, black people, trans people, and queer people. The only hesitance I feel around saying, this is fascism, centers around intent. How much of what they do and say do they believe in? And how much is just riding a wave of fascist sympathy to fuel a narcissistic lust for power and ram through policies that make them rich. But ultimately, while there is some tactical value in this distinction, you have to deal with an opportunist differently from a true believer, in most contexts, the difference doesn't matter. Many will just tell you the correct term for Nazi sympathizer is Nazi. But if you won't take that leap, consider this. Even if they have no particular plan or aptitude for creating a fascist government, any body in power that uses fascist rhetoric, lays the groundwork for future fascism, and empowers fascist movements, needs to be at least viewed through the lens of fascism. Whether or not they're fascists in their hearts is a question for historians. Whatever they are, they are, some percentage of the time, doing fascism. And for our purposes, that's all we need to know.